Hey, 42 here. When you think of the coolest people who ever lived, it's hard to beat the cowboys of the Old West. Pretty much everything about them is utterly iconic. Imagine spending your days crossing epic vistas and going on the hunt for Curly's gold before hitting the local saloon to cheated cards and get into gunfights. All before tipping your 10 gallon hat to the nearest prostitute and clip clopping away into another perfect sunset. It certainly beats a stressful commute followed by eight hours of Microsoft Excel. The quintessential Wild West period started at the end of the American Civil War in 1865 and ended with the official closing of the frontier by the US Census Bureau in 1895. Though some scholars believe the Wild West was briefly reopened by Will Smith in 1999. During the late 19th century, thousands of settlers were crossing the US in search of fortune and glory on the new frontier. It's during this period that we first hear many of the names that still live on in infamy 150 years later, like the legendary hunter and impresario Buffalo Bill, legendary lawman Wyatt Earp, and sharpshooter Calamity Jane. But of all the famed folk and felons of the Old West, there was not a fellow more fearsome than James Butler Hickok a man who so epitomized the Wild West that he was actually nicknamed Wild Bill. Christmas came early this year because I got gifted the new performance package by Manscaped. Let's check it out. The Lawn Mower 4.0 waterproof cordless trimmer is built with advanced skin safe technology, which helps to reduce nicks and cuts on your most sensitive areas. And it has this really cool LED light, which is really helpful for grooming on those cold, dark winter nights. And for a stocking stuffer for you, there's the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. This stuff is a game changer. New to the collection is the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Now, I didn't know that I needed this so badly, but let me tell you, I'm glad Santa hooked me up. Every guy out there needs to add Manscaped to their wish list this season. Or if you've got a special man in your life that's been extra good this year, make sure you get him the performance package by Manscaped. And for a limited time, you'll also get two free gifts, the shared travel bag and the Manscaped high performance anti-chafing boxer briefs. That's a gift on top of a gift. So don't wait around, go to manscaped.com 42 to get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts. Your jingle balls will thank you. And thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Born in 1837 into a household where guns were as normal as milk and potatoes, Bill became an excellent marksman at an early age. He lived with his family on a farm in rural Illinois, a few hours from Chicago. The area was rife with gangs of outlaws, collectively known as prairie bandits. And being good with a six shooter was an important life skill, no matter how old you were. But whilst an early exposure to guns and ammo was par for the course, the fact that his father, William, was an active abolitionist was rather more unusual. The family home was a station on the so-called Underground Railroad, a network of routes and safe houses used by slaves to escape to states where slavery was illegal. Bill's father was tragically killed because of his stance on abolition when Bill was just 15, and it had a big impact on the young man's life. Both Bill's parents were devout Baptists, and although it seems their religious views didn't quite rub off on their pistol-toting infant, their activism around slavery certainly did. At 18, he moved to what was then called the Kansas Territory to join an anti-slavery vigilante group known as the Jayhawkers. It was there that he met a cocky 12-year-old scout by the name of William Cody, though you probably know him as Buffalo Bill, one of the most famous figures from the Old West. Their paths would cross again soon, but not before both had become living legends. The next job on Wild Bill Hickok's Wild West resume was working for a stagecoach company. At the time, driving a horse-drawn coach cross-country was fraught with all kinds of dangers, as Bill would soon discover. In 1860, he was driving from Missouri to New Mexico when he was attacked, not by bandits, but a bear. As occupational hazards go, it wasn't the kind of thing that would typically be covered in the company handbook, and for most of us, it would have meant a grisly end. But not for Bill. Against all odds, he managed to take on two tons of ursine aggression and come out on top, killing the bear with his bare hands. 
Okay, he had a knife too, but the inaccuracy was worth it for the pun. After his unofficial audition for The Revenant, Biller was left badly injured, his chest, shoulder and arm severely crushed. It took him months in bed convalescing before he was well enough to work again. And when he was, he was sent by his employers to a stagecoach station in Rock Creek, Nebraska. And it was there that he sealed his reputation as a man you most certainly did not want to f*** with. Local landowner David McCannells took a disliking to Bill, giving him the nickname Duck Bill on account of his long nose. I can only assume McCannells didn't know that the man he was mocking had recently kicked seven shades of shit out of a bear. McCannells and two of his buddies, plus McCannells' 12-year-old son, ambushed Bill Hickok whilst he was working, and things quickly escalated. Exactly what happened next varies depending on which source you read, but the end result is all the same. A gunfight leaves three men dead, and Bill very much alive. I should probably point out that the 12-year-old child was physically unharmed in the melee. Deeply traumatised, but physically unharmed. Bill was acquitted of the murders, as it was believed he'd acted in self-defence. And it's at this point that the legend of Wild Bill really starts to take shape. The shooting of the three men in Rock Creek soon became legend. And as legendary tales often are, over the years this one was embellished for dramatic effect. By the time the story appeared in Harper's Monthly magazine, it sounded like something out of a Sylvester Stallone film. And not one of the modern ones with <laughs> acting and emotions and all that. Huh? One of those 80s oh. films where he just machine guns everybody he meets for an hour and a half straight. In this fluffed up fable now known as the McCannells Massacre, Bill took down 10 bloodthirsty desperados with just a revolver and a knife, sustaining 11 bullet wounds and 13 knife wounds in the process. Shortly after the American Civil War broke out in April 1861, Bill joined the Union Army of the North, and it was there that he earned the name by which people would refer to him for generations to come. So what exactly do you have to do to become known as Wild during what was indisputably one of history's craziest periods? Well, in one famous incident, Bill is said to have dispersed an angry mob intent on hanging a bartender by firing into the air and then just basically staring everyone down until they went away. No doubt that took some balls, but I suppose when you've wrestled an actual real-life bear, a few disgruntled humans hardly registers. However the name of Wild Bill came about, it stuck, which I'm sure Bill preferred to being compared to a duck. After leaving the army, in June 1865, Bill made his way to Springfield, Missouri. And within a month, he got involved in another shootout which would further burnish his bad boy reputation. And this one turned out to be a stone-cold Old West classic. His opponent was Davis Tutt, and the two men had fallen out over a dispute over a gambling loan. To cut a long story short, Bill owed Tutt money. And when Bill failed to pay, Tutt took his prized gold pocket watch instead. Bill's pride was already wounded by this incident, and when Tut started flaunting that watch all over town, he quickly learned that you can't humiliate a bear-killing, sharp-shooting war veteran whose first name is Wild and expect to get away with it. The two men glanced each other across the town square, and both adopted the classic quick-draw stand so familiar to us today from westerns. At this point, I like to think a tumbleweed blew across the square, a frightened saloon owner pulls the shutters closed, and an old prospector dropped his bottle of moonshine and got the hell out of there. Both men drew at a distance of 75 yards. When the dust had settled, Davis Tut was dead. Whether or not Bill did that thing where you spin the gun on your finger before putting it back in the holster, we don't know. But let's just say that he almost definitely certainly did. This quick draw shootout, now so familiar to us thanks to Hollywood, is rumoured to have been the first of its kind in history. Two days later, Bill was arrested for murder, reduced to manslaughter before his trial began. It should have been an open and shut case, but only four witnesses had actually seen the fight and they couldn't all agree on exactly what had happened. In the end, Bill was acquitted once again, much to the horror of many and he left the court a free man. 
Several weeks later, he was interviewed by journalist George Nichols, the man credited with spreading the Wild Bill legend after he wrote an article about the gunfighter for Harper's Magazine. Now, Nichols was basically the 19th century version of Kim Jong-un's spin doctor. In the article, he claimed Bill had killed hundreds of men and was such a dead-eye shot that he could put six bullets into a target no bigger than a human heart from 50 yards. Bill would spend the next few years working as an army scout, including working for General Custer, who achieved Old West infamy himself by leading a spectacularly unsuccessful offensive at the Battle of Little Bighorn, commonly known as Custer's Last Stand. Despite his, shall we say, volatile personality, it was always Bill's ambition to be on the right side of the law. And in 1869, he was elected Marshal of the city of Hayes and Sheriff of Ellis County, both of which are in Kansas. With a badge on his chest, Bill was soon back doing what he did best, making caps pop and bodies drop. In only his first month as sheriff, he really hit the ground running by killing two men in cold blood. And a year later, he was involved in another gunfight, wounding one man and killing another after they pinned him to the floor in a saloon brawl. In 1871, Bill moved to Abilene, becoming Marshal once again but it was to be his last posting as a lawman after a dispute that began with a bull's erection ended in tragedy. And yes, you did hear that correctly. The bull in question could be found on the sign of a saloon in Abilene called the Bull's Head. And it had been depicted, shall we say, standing proudly to attention as a kind of 19th century marketing stunt cooked up by the saloon's owners. Famous Old West businessman Phil Coe and renowned gunslinger Ben Thompson. Some of the townsfolk were less than happy to see this um, raging bull on full display in public, although I'm not sure why. Every town needs a USP, and the Abilene Bulls Wang is perfect for tempting tourists. Still, Wild Bill asked the saloon's owners to tone down their bovine pornography just a bit, and when they refused, he took the bull by the horns, well, penis, and changed it anyway. The argument came to a head on October the 5th. Co was celebrating the end of cattle season, by firing off a couple of shots from his pistol. That man really had a thing for cows, didn't he? Marshal Bill was summoned to see what all the commotion was about, and Co claimed he'd been shooting at a stray dog, which was not only legal in Abilene, it was encouraged to the point where people were given 50 cents for every stray they shot. But Bill was clearly skeptical because he ordered that Co be arrested. Rather than come quietly, Co the cow lover drew his pistols. Badge or no badge, Wild Bill was a man who met violence with violence. And in the ensuing gunfight, he shot Co twice in the stomach. The wounds would prove fatal three days later. By now, Wild Bill's wicked quick draw was renowned in every town. But as many of you will already know, sometimes unloading too quickly can be a bad thing. In the confusion of the fight with Co, Bill's deputy had rushed in to help, but Bill mistook the man for an attacker, and thanks to those rapid reflexes of his, he shot and killed his brave colleague before he even knew what he was doing. Bill was, understandably, stripped of his position as marshal, and he left Abilene shortly afterwards. This act of manslaughter is said to have haunted him for the rest of his days, and he was never involved in another gunfight for as long as he lived. After such a tragedy, an attempted career in showbiz might seem like an unlikely next step. But in a life as bizarre as Bill's, you shouldn't rule anything out. In 1873, he was approached by that plucky scout he'd met in his younger days, William Cody, who'd spent the intervening years forging a legend of his own, and was now touring with Wild West-themed shows as Buffalo Bill. Bill, Buffalo, asked Bill Wild if he'd like to join him and the equally awesomely named Texas Jack Amahundro in a production called The Scouts of the Prairie. Wild Bill agreed, but it turned out he wasn't really made for the limelight. And when I say not made for the limelight, what I really mean is that he used to hide behind the scenery and once responded to a spotlight being shone on him by shooting it off the ceiling. Yeah, he left after only a few months. 
He drifted for a few years, plagued by deteriorating eyesight and with little money to his name. Not that it was all doom and gloom, it was around this time he met the woman he'd eventually marry. Agnes Thatcher Lake had lived her life every bit as exciting as Bill's. She was a former tightrope walker whose first husband ran a circus. When he'd been shot and killed while ejecting a customer from the big top, Agnes had taken over the business. She was over a decade older than Bill and already had a daughter, but the two must have felt like kindred spirits and they married in March 1876. Though Bill left Agnes not long afterwards to try and make his fortune looking for gold in South Dakota. Say what you want about the man, he bloody loved an adventure. But like all adventures, Bill's had to come to an end sometime, and it was in the aptly named town of Deadwood that he penned his final chapter. On the 1st of August, 1876, he was playing poker in Nuttall and Mann's famous saloon when he was shot in the back of the head by fellow gambler Jack McCall, who'd lost heavily to Bill in a poker game the day before. Bill was shot at point-blank range, and the bullet passed through his skull and hit one of the other players in the arm, proving that even in death he was a danger to others. The hand of cards Bill held when he died was a pair of aces and a pair of eights, all black. And this has since become known as the dead man's hand. In the century and a half since Bill died, there have been numerous books written about him, and he's been portrayed many times over in films and TV. It seems no matter what else changes, we still love our cowboys wild, and Wild Bill was surely the wildest of them all. Thanks for watching.